Chapter 10 Part 1 of 2 Of the Guns of Bull Run A Story of the Civil War's Eve This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Jonathan Brubaker. The Guns of Bull Run, a story of the Civil War's Eve, by Joseph A. Altscheller. Chapter 10. The boat was secured firmly among the bushes, and finding an abundance of fallen wood along the beach, they pulled it into a heap and kindled a fire. The night, as usual, was cool, but the pleasant flames dispelled the chill, and the cove was very snug and comfortable after a day of hard and continuous work. Jarvis and Ike did the cooking, at which they were adepts. After pulling a boat ten or twelve hours, there's nothing like something warm inside you to make you feel good, said Jarvis. Ike, you lunkhead, hurry up with the coffee pot. Me and Harry can't wait more'n a minute longer. Ike grinned and hurried. A fine bed of coals had now formed, and in a few minutes a great pot of coffee was boiling and throwing out savory odors. Jarvis took a small flat skillet from the boat and fried the corn cakes. Harry fried bacon and strips of dried beef in another. The homely task, in good company, was most grateful to him. His face reflected his pleasure. Providing it don't rain on you, camping out is stimulating to the body and soul, said Jarvis. You don't know what a genuine appetite is until you live under the blue sky by day and a starry sky by night. Harry, you'll find three tin plates in the locker in the boat. Fetch em. Harry abandoned his skillet for a moment and brought the plates. Ike, the coffee now being about ready, produced three tin cups, and with these simple preparations they began their supper. The flames went down, and the fire became a great bed of coals, glowing in the darkness, and making a circle of light, the edges of which touched the boat. Harry found that Jarvis was telling the truth. The long work and the cool night air, without a roof above him, gave him a hunger, the like of which he had not known for a long time. He ate cake after cake of the cornbread, and piece after piece of the meat. Jarvis and Ike kept him full company. "'Didn't I tell you it was fine?' said Jarvis, stretching his long length and sighing with content. "'I feel so good that I'm near busting into song.' "'Then bust,' said Harry. "'Soft o'er the fountain, lingering falls the southern moon. "'Far o'er the mountain breaks the day too soon. "'And thy dark eyes splendor, where the warm light loves to dwell, "'weary looks yet tender, speak their fond farewell. "'Nita, Juanita, ask thy soul if we should part. "'Nita, Juanita, lean thou on my heart.' The notes of the old melody swelled, and, as before, the deep channel of the river gave them back again in faint and dying echoes. Time and place and the voice of Jarvis, with its haunting quality, threw a spell over Harry. The present rolled away. He was back in the romantic old past, of which he had read so much, and Boone and Kenton, and Herod, and the other great forest rangers. The darkness sank down, deeper and heavier. The stars came out presently and twinkled in the blue. 
yet it was still dim in the gorge, save where the glowing bed of coals cast a circle of light. The Kentucky, showing a faint tinge of blue, flowed with a soft murmur. Harry and Ike were lying on the grass, propped each on one elbow, while Jarvis, sitting with his back against a small tree, was still singing. When in thy dreaming, moons like these shall shine again, and daylight beaming prove thy dreams are vain, wilt thou not, relenting, for thy absent lover sigh, in thy heart consenting to a prayer gone by, Nita, Juanita, let me linger by thy side, Nita, Juanita, be thou my own fair bride. The song ceased, and the murmur of the river came more clearly. Harry was drawn deeper and deeper into the old, dim past. Lying there in the gorge, with only the river to be seen, the wilderness came back, and the whole land was clothed with the mighty forests. He brought himself back with an effort when he saw Jarvis looking at him and smiling. "'Tain't so bad down here on a spring night, is it, Harry?' he said. "'Always providin', as I said, that it don't rain.' "'Where did you get that song, Sam?' asked Harry. They had already fallen into the easy habit of calling one another by their first names. "'From a traveling feller that wandered up into our mountains. He could play it and sing it most beautiful, and I took to it right off. It grips you about the heart some way or other, and it sounds best when you are out at night on a river like this.' Harry, I know that you're going through our mountains to get to Richmond and the war. Me and that lunkhead, Ike, my nephew, he've a liking to you. Now what do you want to get your head shot off for? Suppose you stop up in the hills with us. The hunting's good there, and so's the fishing. Harry shook his head, but he was very grateful. It's good of you to ask me, he said but I'm bound to go on. Well, if you're bound to do it, I reckon you just have to. But we're leaving the invite open. If you change your mind on the trip, all you've got to do is say so, and we'll take you in. Ain't that so, Ike? Ike grinned and nodded. His uncle looked at him admiringly. Ike's a lunkhead, he said. "'But he's great to travel with. "'You kin just talk and talk and he never puts in. "'But he agrees with all you say. "'Now, fellas, we'll put out the fire and roll in our blankets. "'I guess we don't need to keep any watch here.' "'Harry was soon in a dreamless sleep, "'but his momentary reversion to the wilderness awoke him after a while. "'He sat up in his blankets and looked around.' A mere mass of black coals showed where the fire had been, and two long dark objects looking like logs in the dim light were his comrades. He cast the blankets aside entirely and walked a little distance up the stream. The instinct that had awakened him was right. He heard voices and saw a light. Then he remembered the rope ferry and had no doubt that someone was crossing, although it was midnight and past. He went back and touched Jarvis lightly on the shoulder. The mountaineer awoke instantly and sat up, all his faculties alert. What is it? he asked in a whisper. People crossing the river at the ferry above, Harry whispered back. Then we'll go see who they are. Like as not, there's soldiers in this war that people seem bound to fight when they could have a lot more fun at home. Just let Ike sleep on. He's my sister's son, but I don't believe anybody would ever think of kidnapping him. The two sat silently among the bushes toward the ferry, which crossed the river at a point where the hills on either side dipped low. 
As they drew near, they heard many voices, and the lights increased to a dozen. Jarvis's belief that it was no party of ordinary travelers seemed correct. Let's go a little nearer. The bushes will still hide us, whispered the mountaineer to the boy. They ain't no enemies of ours, but I guess we'd better keep out of their business. Though my inquiring turn of mind makes me anxious to see just who they are. They walked to the end of the stretch of bushes, and, while yet in shelter, could see clearly all that was going on, especially as there was no effort at concealment on the part of those who were crossing the stream. They numbered at least two hundred men, and all had arms and horses, although they were dismounted now, and the horses, accompanied by small guards, were being carried over the river first. Evidently, the men understood their work, as it was being done rapidly and without much noise. Harry's attention was soon concentrated on three men who stood near the edge of the bushes, not more than thirty feet away. They wore slouch hats and were wrapped in heavy dark cloaks, though they stood with their backs to him, and although they seemed to be taking no part in the management of the crossing, they watched everything intently. Two of them were very tall, but the third was shorter and slender. The moon brightened presently, and some movement at the ferry caused the three men to turn. Harry started and checked an exclamation at his lips, but the watchful mountaineer had noted his surprise. "'I guess you know him, Harry,' he said. "'Yes,' replied the boy. "'See the one in the center, with the drooping mustaches and the splendid figure? "'People have called him the handsomest man in the United States. "'He was a guest at my father's house last year, when he was running for the presidency. "'It is the man who received more popular votes than Lincoln, but fewer in the Electoral College.' Breckenridge? Yes, John C. Breckenridge. Why, he's younger than I expected. He don't look more'n forty. Just about forty, I should say. The other tall man is named Morgan. John H. Morgan. I saw him in Lexington once. He's a great horseman. The third, the slender man, who looks as if he were all fire is named Duke, Basil Duke. I think that he and Morgan are related. I fancy they are going south, or maybe to Virginia. Harry, these are your people. Yes, Sam, they are my people. The mountaineer glanced at the tall youth who had found so warm a place in his heart and hesitated, but only for a moment. Then he spoke in a decided whisper. Since they are your people, and are going on the same business that you are, though maybe not by the same road, now is your time to join them, instead of working your way across the hills with two ignorant mountaineers, like me, and that lunkhead Ike, my nephew. No, Sam. I'll confess to you that it's a temptation, but it's likely that they're not going where I mean to go. And where I should go. I'm going to keep on with you, unless you and Ike throw me out of the boat. Well spoke, boy, said Jarvis. He did not tell Harry that Colonel Kenton had asked him to watch over his son until he should leave him in the mountains, and that he had given him his sacred promise. He understood what a powerful pull the sight of Breckenridge, Morgan, and Duke had given to Harry, and he knew that if the boy were resolved to go with them, he could not stop him. All the horses were now across. The three leaders took their places in the boat, reached the farther shore, and the whole company rode away in the darkness. Despite his resolution, Harry felt a pang 
when the last figure disappeared. Our curiosity being gratified, I think we'd better go back to sleep, said Jarvis. The anchors weighed. Farewell. Farewell. We're seeing them going south, Harry. I dream ahead sometimes, and I dream with my eyes open. And I seen the horsemen riding in the night, as I see them by the thousands, riding over a hundred battlefields, their horses' hooves treading on dead men. Those are good men, brave and generous. Oh, I don't mean them in particular, not for a minute. I mean a whole nation, struggling and struggling, and a swaying, and a swaying. I see things that people neither north nor south ain't dreamed of yet. But sure, what am I running on this way for? That lunkhead, Ike, my nephew, ain't such a lunkhead as he looks. Them that say nothing ain't ever got nothing to take back, and don't ever make fools of theirselves. It's time we was back in our blanket sleeping sound, cause we've got another long day of hard rowing before us. Ike had not awakened, and Jarvis and Harry were soon asleep again. But they were up at dawn, and, after a brief breakfast, resumed their journey on the river, going at a good pace toward the southeast. They were hailed two or three times from the bank by armed men, whether of the north or south, Harry could not tell. But when they revealed themselves as mere mountaineers on their way back, having sold a raft, they were permitted to continue. After the last such stop, Jarvis remarked rather grimly, They don't know that there are three good rifles in this boat, backed by five or six pistols, and that at least two of us, meaning me and Ike, are about the best shots that ever come out of the mountains. But his good nature soon returned. He was not a man who could retain anger long, and before night he was singing again. As I strayed from my cot at the close of the day to muse on the beauties of June, neath the jessamine shade I espied a fair maid, and she sadly complained to the moon. "'But it's not June, Sam,' said Harry. "'There is no moon.' "'No, but June's a-coming next month, "'and the moon's a-coming tonight. "'That is, if them clouds straight ahead "'don't conclude to John to make a fuss.' "'The clouds did join, "'and they made quite a fuss, "'pouring out a great quantity of rain, "'which a rising wind whipped about sharply.' But Jarvis first steered the boat under the edge of a high bank, where it was protected partly, and they stretched the strong canvas before the first drops of rain fell. It was sufficient to keep the three and all their supplies dry, and Harry watched the storm beat. Soul and thunder rolled up from the southwest, and the skies were cut down the center by burning strokes of lightning. The wind whipped the surface of the river into white, foamy waves. But Harry heard and beheld it all with a certain pleasure. It was good to see the storm seek them, and yet not find them, behind their canvas cover. He remained close in his place and stared out at the foaming surface of the water. Back went his thoughts again to the far-off troubled time when the hunter, in the vast wilderness, depended for his life on the quickness of eye and ear. He had read so much of Boone and Kenton and Herod and his own great ancestor, and the impression was so vivid that the vision was translated into fact. "'I'm a-feeling your feelings, too,' said Jarvis, who, glancing at him, had read his mind with almost uncanny intuition. Times like these, the engines and the wild animals all come back, and I've felt them stronger way up in the mountains, where nothing of the old days is gone, except the engines, 
Ike. Well, I guess it's cold grub for us tonight. We can't cook anything in all this rain. Reach into that locker and bring out the meat and bread. This ain't so bad after all. We snug and dry, and we've got plenty to eat. So let the storm howl. They bore him away when the day had fled, and the storm was rolling high, and they laid him down in his lonely bed by the light of an angry sky. The lightning flashed, and the wild sea lashed, the shore with its foaming wave, and the thunder passed on the rushing blast as they howled over the rover's grave. The full tenor rose and swelled above the sweep of wind and rain, and the man's soul was in the words he sang. A great voice, with the accompaniment of storm, the water before them, and the lightning blazing at intervals, and the thunder rolling in a sublime refrain, moved Harry to his inmost soul. The song ceased, but its echo was long in dying on the river. Did you pick up that, too, from a wandering fiddler? asked Harry. No, I don't know where I got it. I suppose I found scraps of it here and there, but I like to sing it when the night is behaving just as it's doing now. I ain't never seen the sea, Harry, but it must be a mighty sight, particularly when the winds are making the high waves run. Very likely you'd be seasick if you were on it then. I like it best when the waves are not running. The thunder and lightning ceased after a while, but the rain came with a steady driving rush. The night had now settled down, thick and dark, and as the banks on either side of the river were very high, Harry felt as if they were in a black canyon. He could see but dimly the surface of the river. All else was lost in the heavy gloom. But the boat had been built so well, and the canvas cover was so taut and tight that not a drop entered. His sense of comfort increased, and the regular, even musical thresh of the rain promoted sleep. We won't be waked up tonight by people crossing the river, that's sure, said Jarvis, cause there ain't no crossing for miles. And if there was a crossing, people wouldn't use the crossing no how on a night like this. So boys, just wrap your blankets around yourselves and go to sleep. And if you don't hurry, I'll beat you to that happy land. The three were off to the realms of slumber within ten minutes, running a race about equal. The rain poured all through the night, but they did not awake until the young sun sent the first beams of day into the gorge. Then Jarvis sat up. He had the faculty of awakening all at once, and he began to furl the canvas awning that had served them so well. The noise awoke the boys, who also sat up. End of chapter 10, part 1 of 2